Not the end. So, uh, the, I, I just have, have, would share a few thoughts that I think we all need to keep in mind. Uh, the first one is that this is not a new problem. Uh, if you go back to, the, to Mesopotamia or the days of the Tigris and the Euphrates, this was a problem. Uh, invasive species have been a problem since there have been humans interacting with plants. And we sometimes forget that and, and we sometimes also fail to use the knowledge that may have been gained by many centuries of, of other issues uh, to guide us. The second important thing I think to keep in mind is that in, in, in most of the conversations you have about invasives, particularly as we talk about rangelands, we almost always jump to non-natives and we're looking at uh, spurge which came from Asia, we're looking at cheat grass, we're looking at other things. This is not confined to non-natives. As you look at other species, whether it's uh, uh, invasive conifers, uh, they're not non-native. They are still invasive. We have species that we've had for years that are out of balance with the system that become drivers in the system when they never should be. Secondly, it's not confined to annual plants. And uh, I was just out in the field for the last three days. Everybody, that's all they want to talk about is annual plants. And you're walking out there and looking at perennial plants that may be the big hairy elephant in the bathtub that you were talking about earlier. And finally, they are not always forbs. Um, you know, I, I used to joke with our neighbors in town. They, they found out that I had a background in plant science to some degree and they, and they wanted to know everything. And I said, well, what is this? And they'd bring all these flowers over. And I finally would just say, that's just another weed, ma'am. Um, they're all weeds, okay? Which weeds do I take out of my... I said, they're all weeds. You just like some better than others. So the other thought that I've had, and, and this is driven by a book that I would really encourage everyone here to read, and it's called The Revolutionary Genius of Plants. It just came out. But one of the things that you read that book and you start asking yourself is, are we really smarter than plants? Are we really a greater being than plants? Uh, just because we're an organism that can walk and talk and sit on panel discussions doesn't necessarily mean <laughs> we're in charge here. And there are some really revelational parts in that book about how plants occupy space, how they expand, that, that go beyond the basics that we might have learned in school. The other thought would be, I believe we don't pay enough attention to plants, soils, and, and that part of our world. We are obsessed with charismatic megafauna. If, this, if we had put the word grizzly bear on this panel, we would be in the grand ballroom down the hall. Okay? If we had maybe put up some pictures of a large bull elk and someone smiling in front of it, we would probably be in half of the grand ballroom. And yet all of those other things are dependent on the plant communities and the ecosystems they live in. So we really need to kind of focus on things that are not necessarily pretty and that aren't charismatic megafauna. And we also need to not get ourselves hung up with pristine landscapes, which years ago they tested audiences about pristine landscapes and they showed them forest ecosystems and guess which one they picked? The Weyerhaeuser tree plant. So it, we got to get beyond that. This is a messy business. That leads to a couple other thoughts I'd share. And the first one is that we, for some reason, have become obsessed with stopping disturbance. And disturbance is a vital part of these ecological systems. It's not about stopping disturbance. It's about understanding it and, in some cases, allowing it to occur within the confines of natural variability and not go completely bonkers on us. We also, I think, fail to think about water infiltration. That's a key part of how systems work. And I, I was in a conversation the other day with an individual that was talking about the system they were working in and how it was completely falling apart and because they had a lot of little forbs like pepperweed and things like that and they had sagebrush and but the system was unraveling. They had a 32% sagebrush canopy and wondered why they had little shade loving water uh, uh, the forbs that didn't need as much water as the native grasses. Well, it's pretty simple. You're not getting any water down to the ground. So things like that are things I think we should think about. 
which ultimately leads to biodiversity. And, and that to me is the key, is how are we managing, how are we looking at, and how are we evaluating biodiversity? What are the barriers to accomplishing the things that, that I think we all desire to accomplish? Well, one of them is our instant gratification in this society. Um, right here, I can order me up a pizza and have it here in just a few minutes. I can probably get a gift for my wife. I can get something for Doug. I can't do that in natural systems. And we cannot live with this instant gratification. I had a neighbor years ago at Red Canyon. I said, have you done anything about leafy spurge? And he said, yeah, yeah, sprayed that five years ago. It didn't work, so I quit. Well, you can't kill it in one year, okay? So let's get over that. We have a huge problem with conflicting resources we need to confront head on and say, we've got to make choices. An example of that is when cultural resources trump our ability to fashion an ecosystem in a way that it should work. And the one that was most compelling to me in the last few years was when we had the State Office of Historic Preservation saying you cannot treat invasive junipers because they had found somewhere where a sheep herder had scratched his name on the trunk of one of them. That is absurdity. And a lack of management is another challenge we face. A lack of management is management. It's just bad management. Lastly, adequate resources. And uh, Mr. Kroll, I think you already got that part down, so I don't need to say anything about funding. But it isn't just funding. It's systems knowledge. It's having teams that can work together that combine soils, vegetation, the users that in that system, and come to systems-based solutions as much as it is about funding. Lastly, and I won't take any more time, I'll be happy to do this when we get to Q&A, I can share with you some great success stories in this state, places where we have attacked cheatgrass and been 95% uh, successful, which to me is about as good as you're going to get, places where we've done that in the context of conifer removal, aspen enhancement, using fire, using mechanical. And I'm just going to share with you that the one thing in those places, everywhere across this state, where we've spent money and seen that kind of result, the one thing that every one of those share is human ability to work together. People can put their, diff their, their uniforms aside, some of their personal beliefs aside, sit down and come to a solution-based way to manage. And when that happens, we get a lot done. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. As you can tell, Bob has some uh, fairly strong opinions on resource management, but they've been very valuable to me over, over many years, and so I appreciate that insight sincerely. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Next, we have Jeremy Mastis, Sagebrush Ecosystem Specialist with NRCS. Let's see if you can match uh, tempo and, in, and intensity. There's no following <laughs> the Honorable Bob Bud, but I think you'll find we coordinated some of our talking points well. Um, first of all, uh, on behalf of NRCS, I want to thank WGA for having us here and as a part of this panel. Um, I kind of want to start with the theme that, that Bob led off on, which is we actually have most of the tools we need to manage invasives. Aldo Leopold, the father of wildlife conservation, taught us this almost 100 years ago. The ax, plow, match, and cow. We even have an advantage, something called chemistry today that helps us as another tool in the toolbox. And a lot of what we're trying to do uh, in the world that I work in, in western rangelands, is shifting the balance between different functional groups of plants. For example, a big problem we've discussed today, invasive annuals, we're trying to implement management not only to reduce them, but we should be thinking about what's going to take their place. It's this ecological approach. Mother Nature does not like voids, and so we need to be thinking about how we're going to replace that void with something that we want. And the perennial grasses are the cornerstone of rangeland resilience worldwide. They're the thing that help us bounce back from drought and wildfire, and so that is a key focus of our management and should continue to be. But when we're dealing with invasives, 
the scale at which the problem occurs, the time that Bob talked about, in other words, having to come back year after year after year, and the uncertainty about our f efficacy can be paralyzing. We often just throw up our hands and don't do anything more about it. You take a look at this photo here, and this might be you know, part of Brenda's operation. It's a 10,000 acre pasture. We go and we do a treatment for some invasives. And if we're lucky, we go out and we stare at our boots doing some plot work to try to monitor whether or not it worked. We might not come back the next year to know if that worked or not. And by five years down the road, we just drive by in a pickup and go, that was a waste of time and money. But we talked a lot today, too, about emerging technology. And I am going to go a little high tech on you and see how we're uh, actually able to leverage some emerging technology to help us with this problem. New partnership uh, with some of our core collaborators, the University of Montana. This is a project with, with support from BLM and RCS and uh, with Google themselves, trying to really leverage the latest and greatest technology to help us in managing our western rangelands, something we call the rangeland analysis platform. Really, this is where cowboy boots meet big data, right? And we talked a little bit about uh, big data can be used for bad, but in this case, we're trying to harness it for good. We've been collecting massive amounts of field data where we go out, we look at that plot level data. It's sitting in archives on computers and nobody knows what to do with it. If we do something with it, it's usually within an agency, never across an agency. So we've actually harnessed over 30,000 long-term monitoring plots through both the NRCS, NRI uh, data set and the BLM's AIM data and match that up with cloud computing technology, which essentially takes the lid off the uh, computational power that we have. Uh, when we add that up with Landsat, you know, the satellites have been traveling around the Earth every 16 days taking pictures since 1984. We can use that information now with ground-based data to come up with this. For the first time, we've got plant functional group maps of the entire western U.S., every square inch, of annual forbs and grasses, perennial forbs and grasses, shrubs, trees, and bare ground. But we don't just have the picture. We have the movie. We have every single year from 1984 to today. And that picture gives us a snapshot at about a 30 meter square level. So in this room, that might be two 30 meter pixels. We can tell you what the continuous percent cover is of perennial forbs and grasses, annual forbs and grasses, and on and on. That information we can start to use to manage the landscape. Here's an example. This is the uh, soda fire folks have mentioned. Um, Brendan may talk a little bit more about it, but about 300,000 acres in size, roughly. This is how we might utilize this data to help us manage invasive annuals. What you see here is a map of the percent annual herbaceous cover from 2017. The dark blue being the you know, really high amount of annual cover, the lighter colors being low. The polygons of those boxes essentially represent land treatments that uh, largely the BLM and maybe some other partners implemented. And when you take a look at, you drill into one of those boxes, the one up in the upper left, here's the kind of data that are now at our fingertips. Within that box, I can plot for you how the variability in those functional groups from 1984 to today. You notice any patterns? In about 2004 or five, we actually had a fire, the first fire in that area. And that, notice the red line, are our annual forbs and grasses. It starts to go wild after that first fire. And then enter 2015 when we had the soda fire, and we see the amplitude go up even higher. But the really cool part, and I'm a glass half full guy, right, is we're aggressively going after it. Those BLM and partners are, you know, spraying and treating and doing something about it. Look at the map. You can see the efficacy of their work. They're reducing those annuals. But we're going to be able to now track that through time at your desk for free 
to know whether perhaps we need to go back out and do another treatment. So this uncertainty about efficacy, we can start to get at that with some of these, these tools. Here's another example. Bob mentioned not all invasives are non-native. We have uh, worldwide tree expansion is impacting grasslands and shrublands. This is an example out of Nebraska, uh, eastern red cedar. But essentially, they're fighting the green glacier that's moving up from the south and taking over prairies. We implement a lot of brush management, we call it, or prescribed fire or treatments. This type of tool can show you how, whether or not your actions are shifting that plant community back towards those perennial forbs and grasses that provide the foundation for all the ecosystem services we care about, or whether or not we need to go back in and do some additional work on those trees. The cool thing is we've stepped this down. It's free. You go check it out at rangelands.app. You don't have to be a GIS expert to do this. We put all that 1984 to today data, every square inch of it's available to any one of you, any one of our producers. It's all right there at your fingertips. Again, as one more tool in the toolbox, you still need boots on the ground, but we're trying to bring that high tech with the old tools we've always had, and let's go after it. Thank you very much, Jeremy. You know, as a starting range rangeland conservationist with NRCS years and years and years ago, I was all, I was always kind of curious what would how this NRI data would manifest itself. You know, we would just go out and collect it, and at the time, the question was, well, where's it go, and what are we going to do with it? Getting back to this data security discussion we had earlier, one of the questions I always got was. Well, what, what are you going to do with that data? And at the time, we didn't have great answers for that. So it's nice to see it being used in, in, a, in a productive way anyway. Next, we have Brenda Richards, coordinator with the Idaho Rangeland Conservation Partnership. Brenda, what do you have to share with us? Okay, well, first of all, thank you for being here. And I have the unique position of talking as a landowner, but I would also like to uh, say thank you to the Western Governors Association because from the time of its conception, it has talked about these issues and provided a forum to bring people together for solutions. And so this is just another aspect. Um, as a landowner, we uh, are partners with most of you that are agencies in the room. And it's out of a necessity because in, we are in Owyhee County, which is 75% uh, federal land. It's about 11% uh, state land, so if you do the math, you see what the tax base is. We are high desert, and so if we are not in communication with our partners, um, we've got a huge landscape that is going to suffer um, not only for recreation, wildlife, access, everything that we're 60 miles southwest of Boise, so we are a huge playground and aesthetic uh, re uh, release, a place where people come to do a wide variety of uh, recreational, um, you know, hunting. Um, we even have people that come out and, you know, to come out and ride or, or help us move cattle. So those things are very important. And in these rural communities, as the private landowners, it's important that we have the trust and the partnerships, which many of the panelists have, have referenced here. So I appreciate um, the Western Governors Association keeping these conversations going. Um, there's many exciting things, and I would like to talk a little bit about, as a landowner, um, and I'm going to specifically reference some of the stuff with the soda fire, what we've been able to do on private property um, that may not always uh, be as easy to do on, on your federal lands, whether it's Bureau of Land Management or the U.S. Forest Service. In Idaho, we're very lucky because our state is a wonderful partner when we have some of these these aspects and we're able to do cross jurisdiction and work on some projects together with the state. Um, I will also like to say that we are making great progress on the federal land level. Um, and that's something that these forums help uh, keep moving forward. It's something that the Idaho Rangeland Conservation Partnership, that's what we were put together with uh, BLM and the Idaho uh, or the Intermountain West Joint Venture and the Office of Species Conservation, our Department of Lands are all part of keeping these conversations going forward. So with the soda fire, as indicated, we burned over 280,000 acres um, in a matter of a very short period of time. Uh, it was 
compiled of our private land, state land, and a lot of federal land. And so one of the things that has to happen right off the get-go is uh, the Bureau of Land Management has to get a fire rehab plan together, but we also had all these other partners, and we had a lot of private landowners. We, we have a, a m tremendous amount of grazing out there, and uh, many of our permittees were affected, 100% burned out. Um, so we were looking towards what we can do to keep these, the economy moving and, and make sure we got the resource um, reestablished, um, private and state, and then the federal also. But on a private, uh, on a private aspect, I want to talk about a few different things. We were able to partner right away um, with the NRCS and the Office of Species Conservation and have conversations about where we could get cedars, where we could get seed, and who we could get to get things moving on the ground. So we didn't have to jump through a lot of the hoops that maybe the federal agencies did because we already had partnerships developed, some trust there, and we were able to get going within a matter of months. Uh, the soda fire happened in early August of 2015. By the end of September, the first part of October, we had these, these items in place. NRCS came up with some, some seed for us. Um, the state came up in helping us come get some cedars together and then through a local network of landowners, we were able to start moving on private and state lands. My middle son is an adrenaline junkie and he works for us. And I didn't realize how much of that he was until the spring after he had done the seeding for us on the state and our private ground. And I saw some of the places he had gone with a cat and two cedars behind. It's great restoration, but as a mother, you don't really want to see that where your son's been and snowbanks. But I will tell you that getting out there with the snowpack, being able to get out there without having to wait for any um, red tape or anything like that was tremendous because we got production back, we got some really good recovery. Um, on the lower ground, when the fire came, we were able to take through our rangeland fire protection associations. We went on the inside. We got four cats in our area that um, caterpillar, the bulldozers. We were able to go around all the private land and do a fire break that gave a safe place for the agencies and for people to be to kind of look out and see what was going on on the multi-jurisdiction land. However, with that, you also have to remember that when you take a bulldozer and put a big parameter around of open space, it, it does allow, can allow for invasives. So on the private ground, again, we were able to go through with the seed mix to uh, prevent the erosion, to get some establishment there in places we might not have had, and to provide future fuel, fuel breaks or fire breaks um, for, for fighting that. So that was something we were able to do on private ground also. I'm going to switch gears a little bit here and talk about, too, um, what we're able to do with invasives. We deal with cheatgrass, we deal with medusa head, and we deal with juniper invasion. On a private land level, um, we can manage our grazing intensity, we can manage our timing. Dr. Perryman's going to talk about this more. But it's really critical that we can look at that. We can go out and manage annually based on uh, the different places of our pastures, the soil conditions, whatever kind of rainfall we've had, all of that aspect. We may graze on our private ground, the cheat grass, two to three times a year, depending on what goes on. We'll get an early spring rain, we'll get one growth of cheat grass. It might dry up a little bit, we'll get another one, we'll get a boom again. We need to be able to have that flexibility. And then you can go out and again, reduce that cheat grass in the fall. Um, with to get the fuel loads down again. So we have that flexibility and we utilize it very, very much on our private ground. Medusa head is the wicked weed of the West as far as I'm concerned. Um, we found it on some federal land um, about 12 years ago and I, you know, we do our monitoring and I didn't know what it was so I had scooped it up and put it in my cannel bag and took it back. Um, it was in small patches at that time, and it is a really uh, difficult plant to manage. Um, it spreads very rapidly, but on our private ground, if we find those small patches, we're able to, again, use possibly grazing at the right time. It is not as versatile 
as cheatgrass. You have to catch it at exactly the right time or it's done. It's a very wicked, um, non-palatable weed. Um, and then it develops this nice thatch and it co uh, competes and doesn't let anything else in there. One thing we did notice in the soda fire is if it was in a, a developed area of, of Medusa head, the fire, even as fast and hot as it was burning, would go right over the top of that and not kill all of the seeds because it, it builds that thatch. It's very self-protective. It's kind of like the carpet in this room. So Medusa head is a little bit more uh, tricky, but we can also use chemicals and, and, and look at that um, on our private ground. The one thing I'm going to echo here that everybody's been saying, this is not quick fixes. When you're on your private ground, you look at things on a long-term basis, and that's something we have to make sure that we get over to the other landscape management aspects. There is no instant gratification in resource management. It doesn't happen overnight, and it's not going to get fixed overnight. So just because something doesn't work doesn't mean you don't, don't continue to try. The other thing we can deal with is, is juniper encroachment. On our private lands, we're able to do juniper, um, juniper eradication to a certain extent. I'm not going to tell you that we go out and take out every juniper tree because there, it has a component in the mosaic of a healthy resource. Uh, there's nothing better in a high desert in the middle of an afternoon if you can find an old growth juniper to sit down and have your lunch under because we like trees. We don't have a lot of them. We just don't like so many that they take up all the water resource and they affect the habitat. So again, we've been able to deal with this on a private aspect. Um, when we're riding, we've got little hand saws we can carry in our cannel bag and take trees down as we see them when they're this big and you can just saw through them in a couple you know, quick, quick motions um, versus until when they are tall enough for you to see over the brush, it's, it's pretty much too late to just do something like that. You need a good treatment in there. So those are some of the things we've been able to do, and we've got some great partners with uh, NRCS, the Office of Species Conservation, um, Soil Conservation Extension, some others. And so um, with that, there's three things I'd like to say is you need to prioritize. If you look at it as the big, huge elephant in the room, yeah, it's there, but you can eat an elephant one bite at a time, and if you've got more partners working with you, you can eat a lot faster. Um, you need to look for what makes the most sense to start with. Not everything's going to be able to be rehabbed, so you need to use it for what it is. Look for what's working out there, the programs, the partnerships, the tools, and the workshops. Um, communicate. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Communication builds trust. And be honest in that communication. If it's not working, go ahead and talk about it. Because if it's not working over here, then somebody might try it over there, and you've just wasted a lot of resource and time. And last, um, funding and a long-term commitment. We've got to get funding, and we've got to have those long-term commitments to get, to get this on a landscape scale basis. And your private landowners are some of your best partners. Most of you are working with them, so I commend you on that and uh, look forward to continuing conversations. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Long-term commitment of funding is is a topic that that was raised in the very first breakout session this morning, and it's been a consistent theme all day. Very much appreciate the perspective. That is something that I think most of us have noticed over time that that's that's a critical element. Um, last on our panel today, we have Dr. Barry Perryman. He was instrumental in uh, my undergraduate education, so. Maybe he can uh, enlighten us some more this afternoon. <laughs> uh, Barry, I am counting on you to keep us on schedule. So please oh, share no. your wisdom with us. When you I know that's done. a stretch, isn't it? <laughs> when do you want to be done? Uh, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and, and visit with the WGA. Uh, all I get to talk about anymore is horses, wild horses, and burrows, and cheat grass. Um, that's my life. Uh, I was at the Wild Horse and Burrow board meeting this morning and jumped in the truck to come down here to talk about cheatgrass. So I get to do both of them in the same day today. And here's somebody from the board buzzing me on my phone now. So uh, we'll ignore that. Uh, I've been talking, uh, uh, well, I'll start out like this. I, I, I have a lot in common with, with old Carl from Sling Blade. Um, 
And one of the ways, one of the things I have in common with him is I'm, I'm the guy that like checks the gas tank to see if it's out of gas before I go tear the engine up. Um, and so uh, that, this is kind of what you're going to see here. This is the way I think anyway. I'm also, I'm, you know, people sit around and arguing about whether a glass is half full or half empty. I'm the guy that comes along and just dumps more water in it. Uh, I, that's kind of the, that's, that's sort of the way I look at things. And so that's what you're going to hear uh, from me. I, I, invasive species, uh, it, it's bigger than that, and dealing with them is bigger than that now. I've been talking a lot about paradigm management changes a lot lately. We just had a paper published, I don't know, a few weeks ago on, on uh, management paradigm changes in the, that are needed, we think are needed in the Great Basin. Um, sometimes you have to back up and take a 30,000 foot view of what's been going on. And what's been going on over the last 40, 50 years, at least within my lifetime, there, a lot of things have changed. Uh, since, you know, the Taylor Grazing Act. I mean, we've got water development all over the place now. Uh, we've got, uh, uh, we've got uh, the end of the Little Ice Age in 1850, and we've had a gradual warming trend since that period of time. And in some cases, it's gotten, gotten warmer. We don't know what's causing it, really. We don't know what's causing that high pressure system to set up over the Great Basin and stay there. That's what's causing it. We don't know exactly what is causing that. It may be a cycle within a cycle within a cycle within a cycle. We, we don't know, but, but the evidence is indicating, at least in the Great Basin, that we're getting a little bit warmer. And, and our, the seasonality and periodicity of our precipitation is changing a little bit in the Intermountain West. I remember back in the late 1970s when I was working in the oil field in Wyoming and Montana, it was cold in the wintertime. <laughs> I mean, we saw 40, 50 below zero pretty regularly in the wintertime. And I don't know when the last time it's gotten that cold. You know, the kids would go out. I remember one year it was 34 below zero in Laramie on Halloween. You know, the kids are putting their snowsuits on <laughs> over their, you know, their Halloween costumes and stuff to go out. So things are changing. We got more people in the United States than we had. You know, in 1960, when I was a kid, we got twice as many people in the United States as we had then. And of course, all, all of the, 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 along the front range, we know about the, the population growth in the Intermountain West, Boise, Portland, Reno. There's 150,000 more people in Reno than there was when I moved there 20 years ago. So we have more anthrop anthropic ignition potential out there. We got more people on the landscape. And we also have this thing called invasive species uh, that have moved in of various kinds. Some of them annual, some of them perennial. But, but they, have, uh, they have done their thing for the last several decades. And uh, we end up with things like what you see on the wall here, um, or the screen here. Uh, this is a picture of the University Gun Ranch. And I want to talk about cheatgrass for a little bit and give you an idea of what I mean paradigm, uh, that to, to sort of illustrate what I mean by paradigm management changes that are necessary in order to manage the resource better uh, into the future. Uh, this, is a, this is an old crested wheatgrass seeding uh, that at the time of this picture, this is from 2006, fall of 2006. Um, it was a, the seeding was about 25 years old at the time and it was all brushed up in uh, 1999 when a fire went through and burned it. And so this is, this is about five or six years post fire. Uh, you'll see out there it's a cheatgrass matrix. This is Simpson Park Range in the middle of, uh, middle of Nevada. Uh, there's a cheatgrass matrix there, but you see some of that, uh, some of those perennial grasses poking up in the middle of that matrix. Well, you know, we all understood that we had a cheatgrass problem and we couldn't figure out, well, what in the world, why does it just keep getting worse and worse and worse no matter what we do? And so I, I went over to, to Central Asia, which is the, the, the ancestral homeland of cheatgrass to see how they were managing it over there. It's kind of interesting. You go over to Central Asia and you walk around. You get out of the truck and you walk around and there's rush skeleton weed. There's three kinds of nap weed. There's a rundo over there. Yeah, every noxious weed on our list is just growing out there. I mean, it's just, yeah. And they don't have any problems with it. They, they basically have no problem. So what are they doing different? I mean, they've been living with it for, you know, eight or 10,000 years. 
what are they doing differently than, than we're doing? So I brought this idea back about, well, what if we manage land in, 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 uh, in the United States and Great Basin like we manage land in Central Asia? Now, I won't get into the specifics with you. If you give me an hour, I can give you a pretty good story. Uh, but they don't, uh, they don't have range fires in Central Asia. And you come over to the United States, and this is what you have. Uh, and so, you know, what is the difference? Just what is the difference? And I don't know what this next slide is, so. Okay, we're back to this. So, in October of 2006, I've been at like four conferences in the last two weeks. So, uh, this, is, uh, this is October 2006. We decided, okay, we'll get our cows out there and we, we'll give them a prescription and we'll let them graze cheat grass in the fall because that's what they do in Central Asia. They graze it in the spring, but they really graze it in the fall after the seed drops on their way back out to their winter range. And cheatgrass becomes very, very palatable. It becomes a preferred feed in this condition. They prefer it over the natives. And so we said, okay, cows go out there because we like our cows working for us instead of the other way around. And uh, we, told, we gave them a job and we said, go out, go forth uh, in October, November, December uh, and graze. And what we, what we realized, initially, we were really concerned about fuels management. You know, if we could just take off four or 500 pounds of cheatgrass fuel, that won't be carryover fuel the next year. Uh, and that was a really good idea. But the ecological things that, that, uh, that came from it were much more important. And so what we did is we grazed that crested wheatgrass seeding in the fall, just in the fall. That's it. Just in the fall from October to about mid-December, depending on what kind of cheatgrass year we had that year. Uh, and our, our goal was to get it down to 100 pounds per acre at the end of that, that period of time. Now, this is after the traditional grazing season typically is in the Great Basin. Uh, and so we went back out there in the fall, we grazed the stuff, and we did that for three consecutive years, 2006, 2007, 2008. What you're looking at now is the spring, yeah, April 2009 is what you're looking at. And what you're looking at is the area of the pasture that was not grazed at all in the trial. So, you know, you see cheatgrass there, right? It's already starting to turn purple and it's April. So we got this really wild fuel accumulation there uh, and, uh, and with this characteristic uh, that we have here is turning purple and it's in April already. Now, across the fence where we grazed it, I'll let that one soak in a minute. You see any cheatgrass in that picture? It's there, but it's about an inch high, and it's got about two seed heads on it. All we did was graze it in the fall for three consecutive years. So everybody said, well, you can't do it. Any it's only 750 acres. You got, you know, that doesn't tell us anything. So we went to eastern Oregon, and we found a permit on BLM, that a uh, uh, winter permit, so we didn't have to go through NEPA or anything or change any season of uses or anything. This is up south of Druzy uh, on the Wilbur Ranch. Uh, and what does that say? 2012, right? Yeah, October 2012. Uh, you see some cheatgrass in there? Mm -hmm. Shake your head this way. And you see some Medusa head in there too. Uh, and you see a lot of perennials. There's blue bunch, uh, wheatgrass in there, and uh, a lot of squirrel tail, and there's some, some poas and whatnot there. And this is on a winter permit. It's about 14,000 acres. Now we're using, we're using protein supplement, liquid protein supplement and block supplement just to make sure we didn't have any train wrecks at the time with the cattle. Uh, and uh, I, there's, there's more, more to that, but we don't have time. But, uh, but nevertheless, uh, so we grazed that in, uh, in the fall of 2012, 2013, 2014, I think. Let's see what the next slide it looks like. Ah, April 2016. Mm-hmm. See any cheatgrass in that picture or Medusa head? It's there, but it's about an inch tall. It loses its competitive ability if you take away that standing dead litter in the fall because that's when it's germinating and that's when it's establishing itself. And if you take that competitive advantage away from it, the deep-rooted perennial grasses, as has already been stated, is our best weapon against this type of invasive species. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Everywhere we've tried this, it's worked this way. Everywhere we've tried it. Now, we're, we're working in the Great Basin where we're winter-dominated precip. 
Okay, you get over into eastern Nevada or eastern Wyoming and you get into that really spring dominated precip, this is going to lose some of its efficacy. But in areas like the southwest Wyoming and uh, Wind River Basin, where you're really winter dominated precip areas, I think it's going to have a lot of utility over here if you can, if you can do it. Now, what does this require? Well, it requires some critters that you can run out there during that time of the year, and it requires the authorization by the BLM if it's on public land. Well, that can be a, an obstacle because we're talking about a management paradigm shift. Typically in the past, what have we done? We turn out in April the 1st, roughly March 1st. We go out on our permit. What do we do? Our permit says you got to get off June the 1st or July the 1st or something like that. Sometimes it's a little bit longer, but that's kind of what we do. We go out with rest rotation. We go out with deferred rotation and some combinations of those things. Now think about standing dead litter. Our management that we have been employing for the last 40 or 50 years has done what? It's grown more cheat grass. If somebody told me to go out and grow as much cheat grass as I could in the Great Basin, the only thing I would have changed in the last 50 years is I would have pulled all the grazers off of it. That's going to require a management paradigm shift within the agency. It's a different way of looking at the world. And so you start looking at the world in this kind of way. Okay, we've got fuels. Where are our fuels? What kinds of fuels do we have? What is the composition of those fuels and the characteristics of those fuels? And where are those fuels in, in relationship to things like wildland urban interfaces or critical wildlife habitat? We can employ this kind of a tool to change those fuel characteristics so that it at least gives us a say in what the fuels are like when it does burn. We're not going to fireproof anything. But it gives us, at least gives us a, a chance, a difference between a direct attack and an indirect attack even on a fire. So it's a different way of looking at the world. It's a, it's a management paradigm change. We have to go back out there after the end of what we consider to be the traditional grazing season. And not every operation is going to be able to do that. Everybody's operation is different. And so maybe sometimes it might be the guy down the road that the BLM might want to come into a producer's allotment and graze some of this stuff in the fall. And that may not work then. Mm. Especially if the guy down the road's got a bunch of trick he's bringing in on the allotment. So there's all kinds of things that have to be worked out. But what we do know now, the science is telling us, is that this tool works. And it has worked everywhere we have tried it. And so uh, it's something I think that we need to, we need to really start taking a, a, a really hard look at when we start talking about the flexibility that the agencies have at this time and the flexibility that the agencies need in order to implement these kinds of things. We need more flexibility with turnout dates and get off dates. We need the flexibility to come back in. That means temporary non-renewable in a lot of cases. When was the last time anybody that you know of had got temporary non-renewable somewhere that it wasn't in Arizona someplace? It doesn't happen anymore because we have entities out there, uh, I, mean, I would use the term NGO, but that's not really what they are, that are ready, willing, and able to stop you from getting anything additional in terms of forage uh, if you're a producer uh, on, the, on the landscape. So I'll, uh, I'll shut it down from there and we can answer questions. How's that? Thank you, Dr. Perryman. I appreciate that. Um, I just have one question before we get in, before we open up the dialogue to uh, the participants today, and it has to do with uh, scale of western rangelands. Uh, you hit on it a little bit. In eastern Oregon, where you have this snow-dominated system, where that that's the precipitation regime that's there, but that's not consistent across western rangelands. So when you have such a broad scale of rangelands in the west, how do you prioritize where you're going to be able to implement any kinds of treatments, whether they be with livestock, chemicals, whatever the case may be? How do we begin to get our arms around where should we put our where should we put our aid? Are you asking all of us or me or? Whoever's got strong opinions on it, I'll take it from anywhere I can get it. You know, I'm going to jump in here as a landowner, and I'm going to tell you that right off the get-go, you need to talk to the people that are on the ground 365 days out of the year to help prioritize. Because 
again, and I think that's where the strong partnerships are coming from, um, because they can tell you maybe where the best places to try something's going to be because it is so vast and help prioritize and maybe where something um, you know we get a lot of people coming through that want to do really good things but if they haven't been there for the number of years it may be an area where that uh, landscape has been that way for a long period of time and and the funding the human resource and all of the uh, energy would be better prioritized somewhere else so I think that a key component goes back to this co communication the trust and then talking to the people that have been there um, sometimes you know that involves your county government too or your your state but uh, your landowners are a huge asset but I, I, I'd follow up with kind of where I ended and and where Brenda did I could probably be 95 percent correct by simply following the money um, because the people who work together in the cooperative manner where they are working for a solution generate more revenue for that landscape than others do and so in this state where we allocate a lot of the money it's real easy for me to tell you but it, what Barry I appreciate the paradigm shift because that becomes a paradigm shift from what resource needs the help the most to what group of people can deliver the product the best it's a human issue not a resource issue yeah I guess uh, I just add that you know totally agree the local perspective the ground-based information but when you scale it up to multi-state and regional and we're talking about funding I think we have a lot of the ecological understanding we need right. to know where the highest risks are for these species. Um, we have the ability, uh, it's part of invasive species management 101, is it easier to treat something at a low infestation rate or a high? There's different tools and strategies for every one of those scenarios you encounter. So we need to be more strategic. And I'm, I'm saying let's get started and let's do, but while we're doing, let's think. And, and be smart about where we're doing it. Here's an example. Uh, you know, here's, here's the check the gas can example. What we've been advocating is, if take sage chickens for instance, what's the number one threat to sage chickens? Everybody knows what that is. It's wildfire, right? What burns? Fuel burns. Where's your wild hot? Where's your, where's your, uh, where's your, your critical sage chicken habitat at on the landscape in any particular district? Go find out, well, wh how, where does it sit in proximity to, to your fuels? What kind of fuels are they? Get everybody out there on the tailgate, and I mean everybody. Get your ARC people out there. Get your fuels people. Get your landowners, your producers out there. Get the BLM district manager out there. You know? Get the state director out. Get them all out there and get them sitting around talking, what, where are our priority areas? Where are our most fire-prone areas? Where is lightning most likely to strike? Where are the fuels? What kind of fuels, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's where it starts, I think. That's where it starts. Thank you, panel. Um, I think it's going to be more productive just to turn this over to, uh, to the participants. See what kinds of questions we have out there. I, I'm guessing there's probably some. So with that, uh, anybody have any questions? Well, it's looking like beer 30. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, the panel will answer questions for beer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm Jim Sturrock, and I'm one of the few that had to kick the dung beetle habitat off my boots as I came through the gate. One thing I've noticed, and nothing has been mentioned, is our changing atmosphere and increasing CO2. All the plants we're talking about are C3s. They utilize CO2 directly. So we're increasing our CO2 in the atmosphere. We're going out and trying to stop the trees. And what do the trees take in CO2? So they've got an advantage over our grasses. So where do we start talking about the cause instead of the results? And I feel the cause starts with the atmosphere. Because I am experiencing in my little area increasing fringe sage, sagewort, and snakeweed. 
Snake wheat died out in 98 and tw uh, 2014 after our drought. First thing I started to observe is sagewort and fringe sage, and then came along snake weed. I'm looking at within the next three or four years, my area is going to be a monoculture plant community of either one, depending on the types of soil. So when do we start talking about atmosphere? You're speaking my language, sir. I mean, th th this is the reality, right? Uh, C the, the C3 being your, your cool season species where you get winter precip, C4 being your more warm season plants. And you in Wyoming are on that transition zone here. So if you're in eastern Wyoming, you get a mix. If you're on the other side, you get more cool seasons than warm seasons. And where Barry and I live, there aren't hardly any warm seasons where I live. It's almost all cool seasons. So I, I can't speak to, you know, the worldwide phenomenon that's happening. I mentioned the tree expansion, that shift to C3, it's happening. But we have a lot of perennial grasses that are C3s that are a good defense as well and will be that, provide some climate buffer in the future. But we should expect some vegetation shifts to be happening, absolutely. Other questions? I just wanted to pick up on that last point. My name is Dana Blumenthal, and I'm an um, invasive species ecologist with the Agricultural Research Service. I work out of Fort Collins, but a lot of my work is up um, in Wyoming. And among other things, we have directly tested the effects of changing atmosphere on a lot of the rangeland species. Uh, we had a eight-year-long experiment where we manipulated both the CO2 concentrations and the temperature over mixed prairie. And um, there's a lot, of, a lot of different things that we got out of that. Um, fringe sage was actually one of our strong responders in one of our studies, uh, so that matches your observations. Uh, but I think most relevant to this meeting is that cheatgrass responds really positively to warming. So. If you get warming levels of what we're expecting uh, well within this century, what we were seeing is in disturbed parts of our experiment and less disturbed parts of our experiment, roughly four times as much cheatgrass seed production. Um, now, the reason for that isn't really complicated. If you think about it, it's what you might expect, which is that cheatgrass is growing during the fall and during the spring. Um, most of our natives are primarily summer active. So you increase the temperature and you make more of that fall and spring decent growing weather, cheatgrass, the, that, that niche that it has is suddenly a better one. So that's uh, just something to throw into the mix here when we're thinking about cheatgrass in Wyoming specifically. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Um, the reception is going to be in the Teton room, and that is that way. Think. I don't know. I live here. I get lost in this building every time I come here. It's the one that says Teton. It's the one that says Teton on the outside of it. <laughs> and then uh, breakfast tomorrow morning is at is at 7:45 in the Wyoming room. So uh, I appreciate everybody coming. Um, I also appreciate WJ hosting this event for us. Uh, again, welcome to Cheyenne if you're not from here, and uh, hope to see you at this reception here in. in right now, really. Thanks a bunch. <laughs>